You're listening to Inside the Village, where all news is local and no topic is off limits. So help me, Bob, it's bully in the alley. Hey, bully in the alley. So help Welcome me, to Inside Bob, the Village, brought to you by True North Mortgage, where you'll get uh, great advice and save a pile of cash. TrueNorthMortgage.ca is where you'll find them online. I'm Scott Sexsmith, alongside my good friend, Michael Friscalanti, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media. I see, uh, to quote Phil Collins' album from Derek, how many years ago? Several. No jacket required. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. I still haven't figured out this uh, this show business thing. Well, you see, you and You're I... You're lucky I put a nice shirt on at all. <laughs> I'm lucky you put a shirt yeah, on. Yeah, that's true. You are. Uh, you're we're, very we're, lucky. We're, we're like an old married couple. Opposites attract, they say. Uh, usually I'm the one that's a little chilly. Uh, you not so much. So mm, it's uh, perfect. We'll give you a pass. But who knows? The next segment, you could have it on. Oh, it's going to be like a trick now. You're going to have to think, where's Waldo? Is he wearing a jacket <laughs> or is he not wearing a jacket? <laughs> and then the question would be, is it actually a different jacket? Because it seems exactly. to be the same one usually. Well, we do shoot in 4K, so it's uh, it's pretty yeah. easy to pick up uh, on those Lucky things. for the viewers. <laughs> yeah, luck, that's the word. Uh, the first word to Frisco, uh, let's start, uh, Frisco, with a uh, controversial uh, story, uh, first reported on by James Hopkin out of Sioux today regarding the Gen 7 uh, chain of gas stations. Yeah, I think I say on this show a lot that we do great local journalism, right? I, think, it I think it's pretty much all I say because I really want to hammer home that point of the great reporting we do. This is an especially great example of the local journalism we do. Um, Gen 7 is a chain of uh, gas stations that are on first in First Nations communities in right. Ontario, including one here in the Sioux on the Rankin Reserve, Batchewana First Nation. Um, they're pretty popular because the gas prices are lower because of different tax rules and they are able to charge uh, less for, for fuel. So you've probably filled up there a lot of people. I think everyone in the Sioux sure. stops by there if they're driving there, they go there. Well, beyond that, sto- beyond that, there's a crazy story going on involving a lawsuit involving the the, fr- the, the brand owner of Gen 7 Fuels. Uh, James Hopkins at Sioux today uh, pulled these court documents. There's a, there's a lawsuit going on in Toronto. Simply put, the, um, the owners of a prominent fuel company, an Indigenous-owned fuel company in Ontario, is accusing a former employee, a non-Indigenous employee, of bilking them out of millions of dollars and using their cash to open up Gen 7. So uh, using their money to, to open it up. Basically, so it's it's not run by Indigenous people at all. It's run by these two, uh, this guy and his, his wife. And the allegation is that the, all the startup costs, everything was being funneled from this other company where they worked. Wow. And they were also allegedly using company money to buy a $3 million yacht overseas um, to take private jets, to take lavish vacations and sort of just live this great lifestyle. So, you know, it's just a crazy story because everyone goes to Gen 7 and fills up gas. But behind the scenes, there's this wild lawsuit going on. Uh, just a fantastic story by James. And and to be fair, the national media picked it up. The Globe and Mail ran the story after we did. So that shows you what great reporting it was. Very nice. Now, we know the statement of claim uh, has been filed. Any update on a statement of defense uh, being filed? Not yet. I think that I, I appreciate you pointing that out. These are allegations. None of them have been proven in court, right? And the, 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 the statements of defense have not been filed, but they will be shortly. So I'm sure there's a whole other wild side of the story that we're, we're going to see. And we'll be yeah. on that. We'll be following that really closely. All right. From Sault Ste. Marie uh, to uh, Sudbury and a uh, disturbing uh, story. Story uh, out of the Nickel City about a patient in a hospital waiting room. Yeah, Len Gillis at Sudbury.com had this uh, it's a disturbing story, right? Uh, someone had posted on Facebook that visitors in the waiting room at Health Sciences North noticed this elderly gentleman on the floor, basically. You know, um, I don't even know how to, how to describe it, but half naked on the floor mm-hmm. in his own feces and urine. Yeah. And people were horrified. They were walking into the emergency room and they see this guy there. And the allegations from people on Facebook was that they didn't, um, the hospital staff said, just leave him there, leave him alone. So a lot of people were pretty upset. And I know that hospitals are, you know, dealing with huge overcrowding issues right now. The wait times are up and, and the staff is exhausted. But I think this really, you know, we kind of hit a pinnacle of just how bad the situation become that someone's on the floor like that. Um, and Len Gillis uh, was reaching out, trying to get to the bottom of it. But the story was very disturbing. And a lot of people reacted to it. I mean... I'm sure you read the story. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty crazy. Just the thought of walking into an emergency room and seeing that. And to uh, Thorold and uh, friend of the show, Bernard Landsbergen, <laughs> reporting on a, a store robbery in his community. Yeah. I think I, I have to be sure, honest. I have a soft spot for Thorold. I work closely with the guys in Thorold, and, and they have this great story. Bernard has this great story um, about a variety store owner who was robbed at gunpoint. And this is one of those, again, I'll say it again, local journalism, right? The police put out a press release about a robbery. They're looking for a suspect. He robbed this variety store. 
they said in the press release that they later found a replica gun. So it looks like he used a replica gun, pretend that it was real. And uh, here's what he looks like. Here's some surveillance footage. Bernard, being the great reporter he is, went to the variety store and talked to the owner the next day about what happened. She was very defiant, just a classic, right? She talked about how as soon as the cops left, she went right back to work because she's got a small business to run and Absolutely. bills to pay. And what I loved about this story was she told Bernard that I was just glad it wasn't an old lady outside who got robbed by this guy. I'm glad he came into my store and bothered me because I can handle this kind of stuff. I'm not going to be intimidated. So basically Bernard's story was about how soon, uh, right after she gets robbed, she went right back to work. And I think the people of Thorold really rallied around that and were pretty impressed. Absolutely. Picked herself up, dusted herself off, and uh, and right back at her. Absolutely. Typical small business owner. The first word to Frisco. All right, coming up in our uh, next segment, we're going to be talking about coyotes. <laughs> I love this. I mean, if you if you read the news today, you feel like coyotes are taking over everywhere, right? There's city councils debating about how to handle them. People are calling for, you know, calls of the population. We've talked on the show previously about that jogger in Newmarket who was yeah. followed by a coyote for, like, you know, a kilometer during a run. And so we're we're going to we're going to dig a little deeper and find out what the truth is here. All right, it's coming up when Inside the Village returns right after this. From newsmakers to celebrities to other prominent guests, you'll find them all on Village Media's new interview series, Up Close and Personal. Join host Scott Sexsmith as he goes one-on-one with well-known Canadians to hear their story. Up Close and Personal. Look for it on your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. Welcome to Inside the Village, brought to you by True North Mortgage. True North Mortgage, where you'll get great advice and save a pile of cash. You can find them online at truenorthmortgage.ca. With Michael Friscalanti, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media, I'm Scott Sexsmith. Pleased to be joined uh, on the line and on Inside the Village today by the co-founding Executive Director of Coyote Watch Canada, Leslie Sampson. Leslie, welcome to Inside the Village. It's so great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Scott and Michael, for having me. It's a real honor, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Leslie, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. You and I have had a few phone conversations leading up to today's interview. And and the thing that triggered me to give you a call was because if you read the headlines today, it feels like the world is under attack by coyotes. Everywhere we look, we're seeing a video that's out there or a story of a, of a person who's who's had a close encounter with a coyote. The sense that they're they're everywhere. But we're hoping you can sort of educate us on that. Is that the case? Are we seeing more and more uh, coyote attacks in Ontario? Well, I think, again, you have to look at uh, where the source of the information is coming from. And, of course, coyotes draw so much uh, traction, especially with media. And uh, I, I think if we look at overall coexistence between eastern coyotes and communities in Ontario, I think we're doing a really great job. However, uh, you know, when these incidents do occur, there needs to be more investigative journalism that goes out to cover these stories. Leslie, uh, following along the uh, the headlines recently, it seems that Burlington seems to be a, a very populated area of coyotes. What is it about uh, the Burlington area that, uh, that attracts so many? First of all, uh, you know, coyotes maintain if there's an established family, they're maintaining a territory and only their related members live within that prescribed home range. And so if you look at the lake effect and there's travel corridors, so you're moving uh, north from the lake, uh, all different wildlife species utilize those travel corridors. And so Burlington happens to be one of those amazing ecosystems and landscapes that uh, work really well for wildlife, in particular canids like fox and coyote. So, um, but I think you know, getting away from the actual geographic landscape for Burlington, there's been you know chronic issues of feeding taking place in that community for well over a decade. And was that kind of what triggered what we saw this summer? We there was multiple reports of attacks, and I think the city actually trapped and killed about four coyotes there uh, over the summer. Is that right? Yes, and uh, you know, again, if if we want to get down to the signs and the facts behind that, um, whether the actual coyote that had bitten uh, the the uh, residents was the one that was killed. I mean, you know, there haven't been any incidents since then, but you know, hopefully, citizens are more aware and responsible and have curbed 
the behavior of feeding and what happens. So, you know, again, we're talking about in, in incidents and, and encounters and interfacings between humans and wildlife. And so once any wildlife species is hand fed by people and it doesn't, you know, because somebody's bitten doesn't mean that that person had a hand in feeding a coyote or a fox or whatever the animal is. Um, but what happens is animals then have this false sense of uh, security that it's okay to approach people for a food reward. And the mistake and misperception is that once you know an animal is fed, they lose their fear of people. That's just not the case. We haven't seen that. We work with multiple coyote individuals and f entire families that have been food conditioned using our methodology of aversion conditioning. And those animals respond extremely well to that method. And it's essentially using behavior, um, sending communication, communicating messages to um, a family or an individual that their behavior is not appropriate. So if they're being fed in parking lots, which was occurring in that community and also in parks and trail systems, those animals will congregate there. So will small rodents. And so then you have this cycle of attraction, but it's the worst kind of attraction because animals then are really their behavior is modified, their foraging and hunting behavior. And then that increases the likelihood of encounters between humans and, and wildlife, and in this case, coyotes. Do we need to do more on the messaging front, uh, Leslie? Is it, is, it, is, it a, is it a matter of public education that people just aren't realizing the dangers of doing that? We see signs all the time about not feeding animals, but maybe people aren't putting two and two together with coyotes. Yeah, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a part of society. I mean, we're human beings. We have a, a real compassion and care for nature. And I think a lot of times these incidents start off as being quite benign, and then they become uh, habitual by the humans, and therefore they become food conditioned and human conditioned. So the messaging is out there, but then what do we do after the messaging? You can't just tell folks you shouldn't do something without providing them with tools on what they can do respectfully towards wildlife. And also, you know, having feeding wildlife bylaws, and if you're not going to enforce those bylaws, it really doesn't do anything other than look good on a piece of paper. And so having the education, which is part of the overall prevention, also highlighting the keystone role that Eastern coyotes play in our communities, because wherever you go, there's rodents. And no matter how wonderful your neighborhood is, rats are an amazing uh, rodent and they will make um, make fast do of a, a empty spot to call their home as well. And so coyotes, fox, birds of prey, ermine, you know, any kind of mink, they're going to be going after these species as well. So you've got a bird feeder that has a bunch of seed droppings and then you have a congregation of other smaller wildlife species which brings the land and sky predators in. So it is the messaging, but then there has to be follow through. And, you know, for any municipality to not have a canid response strategy in place today and then work their plan within that strategy, it, it really does become uh, an issue of political will um, as far as, as we, we've observed it. Leslie, if we can uh, talk safety for a second, I know if, if you have a bear encounter, I think the thing is, is you're supposed to back away and wave your arms and make noises. Uh, I read a story a few weeks back about a, a lady who was out for a morning run and encountered a coyote. Um, what, what should we do? What, what, what is the best practice uh, if we happen to, uh, to run into one? Yeah, I mean, depending again, where are we talking? If a coyote's in the field hunting, I think we need to leave wildlife alone. If you're out running on a trail, the, the first thing you need to do is stop running. Dogs will chase people. We all know people that have been chased by dogs and coyotes can be triggered by that same behavior of somebody running and moving away. It, it can be play or chase behavior as well. So being aware of your surroundings, putting your earbuds away, not being, you know, standing around talking on your cell phone, especially in an area that you know might have coyote activity, 
and then be prepared. You can use aversion conditioning techniques, very simple ones. People carry, um, you know, shake cans or they might have an umbrella. If you're a runner, you can have, you know, use a whistle. Whistles are okay in certain circumstances. Um, the problem with using a whistle in an urban scape is that um, urban wildlife here, horns honking, radios playing, people laughing and yelling, and whistles at sports fields. So some folks that are uh, chronic feeders of coyotes will actually use whistling to bring them in to feed them. And so being aware, go to our website and look at our resources, keeping coyotes away, um, understanding the worst thing we can do is give inconsistent, really um, laissez-faire uh, messaging to coyotes. We need to be firm and assertive at all counts. And if you happen to be walking a small dog, you pick your small dog up. If you have a small child, you pick your small child up or bring that dog or child close to you and be very assertive. Now, if it's during um, you know seasonal milestones, I mean, to look at coyotes and what to, we should be doing, we have to look at the seasonal milestones as well. So if it's uh, the time of year where they're raising pups and they start behaving in a very bluff charging or arching their back or howling or barking because there's a dog around being uh, walked off leash, that's a problem. So residents need to be aware what's happening in wildlife world right now is this denning season or is it mating season coming up in the middle of february we'll have uh, the mated pair that will also be very closely seen together so you'll see more pairs together in the in that month period leading up to actual the middle of february as well and so being aware of that and educating yourself and really the last thing that we want to uh, have is people um, behave in an inappropriate way because they're afraid because they don't have the tools or the strategies to know what to do. Popping an umbrella. But if you're out running, you got to put those earbuds away. So you're aware of what's happening. And if there's food on a trail system or in a parking lot or by a park bench or a picnic table, that has to be reported. Get the name of the person that you speak to through the city official system make sure because we ask so many well who'd you speak to oh well i don't know well it's not helping anybody you need to know who you spoke to what guidelines they provided to you if any and then also um you know talk about it uh with your neighbors as well i know from uh, from time to time we'll run into uh, bears on the golf course uh during the golfing season and we have a, a bit of a running joke that you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the slowest golfer in your force. And... <laughs> I was going to say, I appreciate all that advice, Leslie, but Scott's pretty fast. I think he might actually, believe it or not, when you look at him, you wouldn't think so, but he might be able to outrun that coyote, I was, I was thinking. I don't know, 40, 40, uh, I don't know. Like, can you run that fast? I don't think so. No. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. I know when you look at him, you don't think so. Leslie, like, not even in my prime. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me tell you, I am well past my prime. Yeah, for sure. You know, it was interesting what you said in your first answer that I didn't follow up on. I'm sorry, but the, the headlines are triggered when we hear about an attack or a city reports an attack. And, and you're right, maybe we need to ask some more questions about it. And I guess what I'm wondering from you is your organization, are you seeing more attacks? Like, are there, are there more reported attacks, say, in the last year or two than there were in previous years? Or is this mostly just more headlines about those attacks? Well, I think... Uh, with COVID, people became, you know, they kind of uh, changed their behavior in, in, in the outdoors as well. Um, so you had either people staying at home more and were feeding wildlife, or you had people going out and engaging in outdoor activities as well. So I think we need to look at what's happening in the community. And um, if we get hung up on the numbers, okay, we're talking about a coyote biting people, then we are we looking at how many times people are bitten by dogs. So exponentially, if you look at that kind of statistic, and I mean, yes, there's way more dogs than coyotes, but most of us share our human space with some form of a pet. And so we have a greater risk of being hit by a, a champagne, you know, cork, or a garage door hitting us or a dog biting us than we do a coyote 
But what I would like to then expand on that and say, okay, what is happening here? Are there reports of feeding going on that municipalities are not acting on? Mm. So if reports are coming in and they sit there in Cyberville and there's not any active investigation being done, then you're not going to mitigate that. And so cases that go on and on, eventually at some point, there could be an escalation of demand behavior from a coyote towards a person. And that's what you see when you see these random cases where, um, and you know what, wildlife can also go through uh, situations where maybe they're injured and we don't know it. We can't see the injury. People do pretty cruel things to one another and animals as well. And so an animal could have an injury which is impacting their behavior as well. But, um, you know, when a coyote is, is biting a person, usually typically that's related to incidents where this is an expression of food demand. They're not getting fed. They've been hand fed by somebody in the community or maybe m multiple people. And so this coyote has mixed messages. So, you know, I think looking at statistics and data, and maybe there's cases as well where somebody has been feeding a coyote that got bit. Mm -hmm. and they didn't report it. Mm -hmm. So it can go the other way. So I think um, looking at the circumstances and what um, processes, what's the standard operational procedures of every municipality when they start to get an increase in coyote sightings because typically coyotes just out of the blue don't start to bite people. Mm -hmm. and you're, you're clearly trying to be diplomatic about it, but really this is people's fault. People should not be feeding coyotes. Well, again, um, it's like the bears, right? You have a bird feeder out in the summer months. What do you think is going to happen in bear country? Bears show up, other animals show up. And, you know, again, I, we, don't, we don't want to put the finger uh, onto one particular, um, you know, aspect of society, but there is a gap here. There's a cognitive bridging that just is not happening between residents between city officials and then also um, with the media. We all have to work together and we do not need to be feeding wildlife to be loving and respectful and carry reverence for them. And I think there's the messaging is very confusing. Plus, and you have photographers as well. There's some really wonderful ethical photographers out there, but unfortunately we have seen that as an increase of changing uh, wildlife behavior to a point where, you know, we have to actually consider encouraging municipalities to have bylaws in place that include harassment and baiting and luring um, by photographers. That's how serious mm -hmm. it is. Leslie, uh, before we let you go, um, tell us about your organization, uh, Coyote Watch Canada, and some of the work that you guys do. Thank you. We, we have a great team. We have on the ground canine response team that are highly trained to work with uh, wild canids. And we also do high level training for law enforcement. Anybody that's a first respond or first responder um, that would be called out in the community to work with these animals. We also do a wide range of educational venues. We have our canid connection speaker series which we have some exciting guests that always come on to the show and um, we are here to support um, our community partners we work very closely with government level agencies and also the individual citizens themselves but we are focused on science education research and coexistence methodologies that truly work and have a proven track record in the field of promoting uh, successful, healthy, and safe coexistence between humans and canids. Great stuff, uh, Leslie. Uh, thanks for doing this today. Leslie Sampson, the uh, co-founding executive director of Coyote Watch Canada. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you, Scott and Michael. Appreciate oh. it. Reporters, editors, and journalists who go the extra mile to get the story and get it right. Go behind the scenes with those who cover the stories that matter most to you and your community. Look for it in the Village Features section of your favourite Village Media website across Ontario.
Welcome back here to wrap on uh, Inside the Village. Leslie was great. I didn't know all of that about coyotes. No, you're right. And you see these headlines all the time. What I found most fascinating is that you've used that analogy of someone, which has happened to you that day, where the garage door fell on your head and the <laughs> champagne cork at the same time. It's for the amazing record, how she seized on that. For the record, I've never had champagne in my garage. <laughs> Not once. Just want to put I that don't know. out I there. Just, that was amazing that she actually picked those examples that all happened to you in one day. It's, it's like the room is bugged. Um, now, fascinating uh, segment, and, and again, I, di- I didn't know all of that uh, or much of that or any of that about coyotes, mm. but was it just me or, or, or could you flash back to the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote? I, I got to admit, it was, it was in the back of my mind, right? And I, and I you, know, I, you know, you appreciate people who are experts at things and they give good advice, sound advice to people, right? But I just can't imagine, first of all, I can't imagine jogging in general, but I can't imagine, enough. I can't imagine jogging and then this coyote comes up and is running beside me. Like, what am I, going to stop? Like, oh yeah, hi. Like, what, what the hell do you do? What do you do? You try to run as fast as you can. It's just the natural thing to do. I, I don't know. And we had that. I was at Newmarket, right? Newmarket today, we had that yeah. story last month where that happened to a jogger. Can you imagine she was, how scared you'd be? See, Anyways. jogging is just simply not good for it's you. It's not good for so you. Don't do it. It's 100%. 100%. It's, it's a health hazard. It's a hazard. And okay. and you and I make the guarantee that we will never do it. Uh, what we will do is uh, take a look back at what's been a fantastic year uh, on Inside the Village starting next week. Yeah, we're going to do two two year end reviews, right? Two year. Two parter. It's so big. We have to there, split it into two. There are so many. I won't say. <laughs> there's so many. There's so many clips <laughs> that we had to split it into two uh, two segments. So we're going to. I think the plan is we're going to do one, you know, good serious look at some of the hard news issues that we covered, and we did cover a lot here on Inside the Village, issues that were very important to Ontarians and, and, and controversial, and uh, we're going to uh, sort of peel back the layers on those and talk about those. And I think the the second episode, our plan is to sort of do some of the lighter side stuff that we yeah. did, some of the uh, some of the interviews with people like Brittle Star when he came on the show, and uh, so it'll be interesting to, to to look back. You know, I, I had no idea that we would get this far in this show. You know, I remember the first couple of days we practiced. And uh, <laughs> it was terrible. So we've uh, we've come a long way, I think. Yeah, and uh, probably even more shocking is we've been picked up for a second season, yeah. um, which will uh, debut on January the 11th, I believe. But yes. uh, looking forward to the uh, to the year ender. Me too. Good one. Thanks. All God. right, inside the village, uh, you can find us uh, wherever you uh, get your favorite podcast at insidethevillage.ca, and of course across the uh, Village Media Network. For editor in chief Michael Friscalanti, I'm Scott Sexsmith. Thanks for watching and for listening. You've been listening to Inside the Village. Fresco and Scott's wardrobe provided in part by Moore's Sault Ste. Marie.